Hello, you own Chan Real Books, and today we'll discuss the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is the problem of explaining the relationship between physical phenomena, such as brain processes, and experience, that is, phenomenal consciousness or mental states or events with phenomenal qualities or qualia. Why are physical processes ever accompanied by experience? And why does a given physical process generate the specific experience it does? Why an experience of red rather than green, for example? The hard problem contrasts with so-called easy problems, such as explaining how the brain integrates information, categorizes and discriminates environmental stimuli or focuses attention. Such phenomena are functionally definable. That is, roughly put, they are definable in terms of what they allow a subject to do. So, for example, if mechanisms that explain how the brain integrates information are discovered, then the first of the easy problems listed would be solved. The same point applies to all other easy problems. They concern specifying mechanisms that explain how functions are performed. For the easy problems, once the relevant mechanisms are well understood, there is little or no explanatory work left to do. Experience does not seem to fit this explanatory model, though some reductionists argue that, on reflection, it does. Although experience is associated with a variety of functions, explaining how those functions are performed would still seem to leave important questions unanswered. We would still want to know why their performance is accompanied by experience, and why this or that kind of experience rather than another kind. So, for example, even when we find something that plays the casual role of pain, for example, something that is caused by nerve stimulation and causes recoil and avoidance, we can still ask why the particular experience of hurting, as opposed to, say, itching, is associated with that role. Such problems are hard problems. Cognitive models of consciousness are sometimes described as potential solutions to the hard problem. However, it is unclear that any such model could achieve that goal. For example, consider global workspace theory, according to which the contents of consciousness are globally available for various cognitive processes, such as attention, memory and verbal report. Even if this theory is correct, the connection between such processes and experience, why they are accompanied by experience at all, might well remain opaque. For similar reasons, discovering neural correlates of consciousness might leave the hard problem unsolved. The question as to why those correlations exist would remain unanswered. Nevertheless, scientific advances on cognitive models and neural correlates of consciousness might well play important roles in comprehensive solution. The hard problem is often discussed in connection to arguments against physicalism or materialism, which holds that consciousness is itself a physical phenomenon with solely physical properties. One of these arguments is the knowledge argument, which is based on thought experiments such as following. Mary is a super scientist with limitless logical acumen, who is raised far in the future in an entirely black and white room. By watching science lectures on black and white television, she learns the complete physical truth, everything in completed physics, chemistry, neuroscience and so on. Then she leaves the room and experiences color for the first time. It seems intuitively clear that upon leaving the room, she learns new truths about what it is like to see in color. Advocates of the knowledge argument take that result to indicate that there are truths about consciousness that cannot be deduced from the complete physical truth. It is inferred from the premise that the physical truth fails to completely determine the truth about consciousness. And the latter result, most agree, would undermine physicalism. The hard problem relates closely to the claim that Mary learns new truths about caller experiences when she first has such experiences. Arguably, if she learns new truth at that time, this is because the nature of caller experiences cannot be fully explained in purely physical terms. Otherwise, the reasoning runs, she would have already known the relevant truths. If such experiences are fully explicable in physical terms, then they should be objectively comprehensible, and Mary seems well positioned to grasp all objectively comprehensible properties. 
The general idea here is sometimes expressed as the claim that there is an explanatory gap between physical and the phenomenal. A second argument often associated with the hard problem is the conceivability argument. According to one version of the conceivability argument, also called the zombie argument, one can conceive of a microphysical duplicate of a human that lacks conscious experiences. Given this, it is argued such a microphysical duplicate is possible, which entails that the physical facts do not necessitate the phenomenal or experiential facts. This, according to most philosophers, indicates that physicalism is false. While many philosophers doubt that the conceivability of these zombie duplicates is indicative of their possibility, the hard problem primarily concerns the first step of the argument. If we can conceive of a microphysical duplicates of ourselves that lack consciousness, then we lack a complete explanation to why the physical facts give rise to the experimental or phenomenal facts. This again shows the existence of an explanatory gap. There is no consensus about the status of the explanatory gap. Reductionists deny that the gap exists. They argue that the hard problem reduces to a combination of easy problems or derives from misconceptions about the nature of consciousness. For example, Daniel Dennett argues that, on reflection, consciousness is functionally definable. On his view, once the easy problems are solved, there will be nothing about consciousness and the physical left to explain. Reductionists often appeal to analogies from the history of science. These philosophers compare non-reductionists, who accept the existence of the explanatory gap, to 17th century vitalists concerned about the hard problem of life. Comparisons are also made to the scientifically ignorant concerned about hard problems of heat or light. Science has shown that the latter concerns are overblown. Life, heat and light can be physically explained. Likewise, say reductionists, for consciousness. Non-reductionists usually reject such analogies. Part of the analogy is usually accepted. The vitalists doubted that how organism reproduce, moves, self-organize and so on could be explained in purely physical terms, in much the same way that non-reductionists doubt that consciousness can be explained in purely physical terms. However, what the vitalists sought to explain was how certain functions are performed. By contrast, consciousness does not seem to consist in the performance of functions. Non-reductionists take the difference to undermine the analogy between the hard problem of consciousness and the alleged hard problem of life. They reject the reductionists' other analogies on similar grounds. Reductionism is entailed by influential theories in the philosophy of mind, including philosophical behaviorism, analytic functionalism, and eliminative materialism. Some philosophers take the merits of those positions, such as their relative parsimony, to provide grounds for a reductionist approach to the hard problem. Other philosophers accept the existence of the explanatory gap and thus regard the hard problem as evidence against those theories. All non-reductionists believe that the explanatory gap is genuine, but some non-reductionists argue that the gap is compatible with physicalism. For non-reductionist physicalists, the gap reflects something about our perspective on the word, not the word itself. These philosophers hold that consciousness is an entirely physical phenomenon, and thus that phenomenal truths are nothing over and above physical truths, even though phenomenal truths cannot be deduced from microphysical truths or the sort of truth that Mary learns from her lectures. Non-reductionists must explain how to reconcile physicalism with the explanatory gap. Here non-reductionists sometimes invoke analogies to Kripke's empirical necessities. According to Kripke, the fact that heat molecular motion is absolutely necessary, there is no possible situation in which there is one without the other, even though the fact was discovered empirically. One might object on the grounds that we can easily imagine a situation in which there is heat, but it turns out no molecular motion. Against this, Kripke argues that on reflection such a situation is inconceivable. What we imagine existing without molecular motion is the sensation of heat, an experience typically caused in us by molecular motion and not heat itself. Non-reductionists sometimes argue that similar reasoning could be used to explain why, in spite of the explanatory gap, 
The physical truth necessitates the truth about consciousness. However, as Kripke himself argues, in the case of consciousness, there does not appear to be a distinction corresponding to that between heat and the sensation of heat. For example, anything that feels like pain is also pain. So Kripke's reasoning does not straightforwardly extend to the empirical necessities entailed by non-reductionist physicalism. Many non-reductionists acknowledge that more is required to reconcile physicalism with the explanatory gap. Here it is common to appeal to distinctive features of phenomenal concepts. Some propose that phenomenal concepts are distinctive in that their reference, phenomenal states, are constituents of those very concepts. For example, David Papineau suggests that phenomenal concepts have the form that state, where the blank is filled in by an embedded phenomenal state, in something like the way a word may be embedded within quotation marks. He argues that the quotational structure of phenomenal concepts will produce a distinctive phenomenal or physical epistemic gap, even if the embedded state is physical. But whether any such proposal can meet the non-reductionist burden remains controversial. Some non-reductionists take the whole problem as a reason to reject physicalism. On most non-physicalist views, consciousness is regarded as an irreducible component of nature. These views tend to differ primarily on how they characterize the casual relationship between consciousness and the physical world. According to epiphenomenalism, consciousness has physical causes but no physical effects, and according to neutral monism, phenomenal properties are the categorical basis of physical properties, which are dispositional. Neutral monism might or might not count as a version of physicalism, depending on whether the categorical basis physical properties are considered physical. Some believe that solving the hot problem will require constructing a psychophysical theory that includes fundamental laws. No such theory has been developed in great detail, but some speculative proposals have been advanced. Certain interactionist dualists argue that phenomenal properties affect brain processes by filling in gaps resulting from quantum indeterminacy. Theories emerging from that sort of argument may involve positing psychophysical laws. And David Chalmers, a leading non-reductionist, tentatively proposes that the basic link between the phenomenal and the physical exists at the level of information. He formulates a double aspect principle on which phenomenal states realize informational states that are also realized in physical cognitive systems such as the brain. Either proposal might provide a kind of solution to the hot problem. The laws will enable deductions of specific instances of experience from underlying physical structures. An important vestige of the hub problem would, of course, remain. There would still be the question as to why these psychophysical laws existed and not others. Such theorists are likely to argue that these laws are primitive, just like the basic laws of physics, and so the vestigial hub problem is neither more nor less puzzling than the questions as to why the physical constants are what they are. Reductionists will argue that such proposals are misconceived, either because they depend on confused notions of consciousness or because they presuppose that solutions to the easy problems will not yield a solution to the hard problem. Non-reductionist physicalists will reject those reductionist arguments, but they also tend to reject the need for a fundamental psychophysical theory. Not all such theories conflict with non-reductionist physicalism. Indeed, these philosophers might accept something like Chalmers' proposal and regard it as a way to bridge the explanatory gap. However, they will regard phenomenal information as a special sort of physical information, special in that its connection to other sorts of physical information will remain opaque without appropriate psychophysical laws. That was all. Thanks for watching.